Good morning. My name is Tony Perez. Uh, you can find me online under the handle of Perez Box. I have a blog in which I write about business and security. Um, I'm also one of the co-founders and CEO of Security. We are a website security company, um, and we specialize in providing uh, post-compromise incident response services and uh, prevention of hacks via cloud-based firewall solutions and intrusion prevention systems. In other words, we clean up the tech websites. Um, for some reason, this slide doesn't like that. I'll just jump. That last image, uh, I actually wanted to talk about that because while it's not security related, uh, we are actually a global company and one of our uh, employees is out of Bosnia and that bridge represents the connection between East and West and his city. Uh, and so one of the things we always try to do when we're talking or even on our website is always try to bring different pieces of the culture of our company, who we are, because it's, it's in our motto, we're real people, real security, and he's just one of our people. So anyways, that's a different story, but for some reason, the mic and that slide don't like each other, although there's no audio on that slide, which is really weird, but um, that's okay, we're gonna move on. Uh, this talk is really for all organizations. Uh, I don't plan to dive into the details uh, of anything in terms of technical, any kind of configuration changes you should make at the application level, any kind of tool you should apply, uh, but it's really kind of meant to provide you a foundation from which you can build on and go back and start asking yourself kind of questions like, how am I accounting for security? What are the things that I'm looking for? Uh, what should I be looking for? What, are, what does today's uh, landscape look like? And what should I be accounting for? And maybe start having better conversations as an organization on how to approach security. Uh, so if you're a developer looking to figure out how to sanitize your inputs or sanitize your outputs, things like that, I won't get into that kind of detail um, or validate your inputs, but um, hopefully you'll find it interesting uh, and insightful. In all my conversations, I kind of like to start by providing some statistics, and I think this is, I have found in a lot of the conversations that I have that statistics help us um, work from the same ground so we understand what we're working with. So as of last week, we were dealing with about 1.1 billion websites on the web right now. 33% uh, of them were being powered by uh, some form of a CMS. 73% uh, of that 33% were powered by these four CMSs, right? So uh, Magento, Joomla, Drupal, and WordPress. And I mean, preface that by saying I did not put that in any specific order. It was just icons, and the reason I bring that is it's already been brought to my attention. I know this is a big event. Uh, it's just high level conversation. Um, of that, Drupal specifically powers about 2.2 of all websites and about 4.9 of the CMS shit. Now, again, this is based on one source with W3 Tech. I know that there's a lot of other sources that I can be using. That's just the source that I decided to use uh, for this presentation. Uh, what's interesting about this is that this should hopefully provide us context in the fact that there are millions and millions of websites that we're responsible for, even in the Drupal, Drupal ecosystem, right? And those have a larger impact on the internet as a whole. Uh, and I can't have a conversation about that without uh, placing emphasis on the importance of migrating to Drupal 8 and, and the benefits of Drupal 8 specifically. I specifically like Drupal 8 because it, for me, applies an ethos of security by default and a lot of the configuration changes that they've introduced in the latest version. Um, Peter Woolman actually wrote a really great piece in which he highlighted <coughs> a lot of the different elements you can um, expect in Drupal 8. So I would encourage everyone to either go to that link and read his article or kind of navigate through some of these changes to understand uh, what the benefits of that platform will be for you. With that in mind, however, um, and I'll be releasing these two so if you didn't get a snapshot, that's completely okay. The, the challenge I find, however, as a security professional is that when I look at Drupal statistics around uh, Drupal usage, only about 8% of uh, the Drupal platforms out there have actually migrated to Drupal 8. Uh, and I think that that talks to a problem that we have in the security community in which we always try to tell folks, hey, update. Hey, why aren't you updating? Just update. How hard is it to update? <laughs> the reality is it's really freaking hard to update, right? Um, if it was easy, we'd be doing it. And the fact is that there's so many elements that we have to account for in our update process. It's not just about updating Drupal, it's about updating all the, the, the API configuration or any systems we're integrating or the infrastructure itself, right? There's so many different things and downtime and affecting our availability just isn't one of those options, unfortunately, which is what talks to this. I mean, Drupal's been out for what, Drupal 8 for about a year with a lot of these changes and yet only 8% of the community is actually upgraded to the latest platform. Um, that's a challenge. And it actually complements a lot of the research that we've done. If you recall, um, we are a company that we do a lot of incident response services. In other words, we clean a lot of messed up websites, a lot of them being Drupal as well, right? 84% of the ones we clean um, are usually out of date running vulnerable versions of, of, of Drupal. 
that also lends itself to some of the challenges we've seen in the past. Yes? Is uh, out of date, is that uh, not upgraded to Drupal 8 or just uh, not the latest version of Drupal 7? Out of date and running a vulnerable version. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes. So um, the unfortunate thing about that is it puts us in very precarious situations, right? Um, most people here should have, should be familiar with Panama and Papers, right? Um, in which there was a huge compromise of, of a lot of legal information, et cetera. It, 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 it disclosed a lot of information about a lot of important people. Um, the unfortunate thing about this compromise, while I personally feel that it was an internal attack, a lot of the news picked up on this idea that, oh, the external websites, uh, which were happened to be built on WordPress and on Drupal, uh, were the point of entry, right? The attack vector that was abused by the attackers. While I, I'm not 100% on board with that, it forces us to look at the reality of what they were looking at and what they're reporting and that there is a possibility, right? The Drupal instance that was being run had itself 25 different instances, 25 vulnerable uh, vulnerabilities within the application. One of them itself being the Drupal Gatton that we're all familiar with from 2014, the major SQL injection issue. So of course, it's the easiest one for everyone to attack. WordPress had three vulnerabilities that they identified. So they said, hey, the probability that one of these were used as an attack vector into the, to perform lateral movement within the infrastructure was really high. Okay, there's a lot of other pieces to that, but it forces us as a community um, to look at this and say, okay, well, how do we account for this? And what it brings to my attention is that the idea of patch and vulnerability management is really, really hard. And for those that are unfamiliar with the terminology, patch and vulnerability management, I'm simply talking to the ability to update, right? It's more official terminology that we use in the security space. Um, and ironically, exploitation of software vulnerabilities is actually one of the leading causes of today's compromises, regardless of what CMS you're running. I started doing a little bit more research and I found an interesting article by uh, the Northbridge folks in which they started to analyze enterprise organizations and how they handle open source. Because I said, there's gotta be some correlation. Although we work in the web ecosystem, there's gotta be some correlation in how organizations manage open source as a whole, right? Not just open source CMS applications. And they found that uh, about 33% of those companies were unable to identify, track, or remediate any of their open source technologies, right? 47% uh, of them uh, were unable, unable to track the open source code that they're deploying within their infrastructure. 50% of them had no one accountable for identifying or remediating those vulnerabilities. Now, I would challenge everyone here to think how that applies to your organization, whether you're a large organization or a small organization. I work with a lot of organizations myself, right? A lot of professional services, things like that, and it's the same question. Same issue I deal with a lot of security operations groups. I'm being forced to support some open source CMS that I never had to account for. My plate is already full. I have no more resources. I can't add anybody else to the team. How am I supposed to stay ahead of this technology? How am I supposed to apply patches to that when I can't even apply patches to my own infrastructure because of my change configuration process or the, the process to getting to that, right? It's something we need to think about. Uh, perhaps one of the biggest reasons I can find as to you know, why these problems exist is, is I think there's just a fundamental lack of understanding of what security is. And those are some of the things I'm going to be talking about. Um, in, in many conversations that I have, you know, it, there's always this conversation around, you know, what is the real problem, right? Um, how am I going to fix this problem, right? As if all of a sudden security became an issue, right? Before today, there was never an issue, right? It hasn't been around for 20, 30 years, it, you know? It is, what, what is this human element to it? Um, and it's just, what can I buy right now and apply it and check that box without a true understanding of what that box is and what you're trying to accomplish with that box. Um, what we have to remember is that security is a, uh, a continuous process, right? It's, it's actually always been made up of this since its, since its inception around people, process, and technology, right? You know, I can't tell you the number of conversations I've had where it's, hey, I've deployed a firewall. Uh, awesome, who configured it? No, whoa, what do you mean I have to configure the firewall? I bought the firewall. I'm secure. You're like, no, 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 no. There's a process to this, right? Yeah, you spend hundred thousand dollars on a firewall, but guess what? Now you need a people in place to configure that firewall. And when that firewall is configured, now you need people in place to continuously update that. Because guess what? Security is not static. It's continuously evolving, and the attacks are continually evolving. The threat landscape is continually evolving, and so your technology has to continue to evolve. The, the, the technology itself isn't making you more secure. It's three, these three pieces put together that improves your overall security posture. 
We have to remember that we're deploying our applications regardless of what that application is, whether it's a basic brochure site or a complex site into a complex ecosystem. And this is really what the attack surface looks like. It's not just about the Drupal application or any of its neighboring applications. It's the environment in which it sits. It's in the environment in which your administrators are functioning and working with and accessing that environment. It's the servers themselves. It's the applications configured on that server. And then, of course, it's the infrastructure itself. Some of these things are not things that you yourself have to be concerned with. You might outsource some of these elements, but you have to be having that conversation. Okay, who's handling my infrastructure? Who's handling my servers? What are their processes in the event of a compromise? What are they doing for me for security? And where does my responsibility start as a website owner? Because many organizations that I've talked to says, well, the host was taking care of this. But in many instances, they find usually after a compromise, the host comes back and says, that was never my responsibility. That was always your responsibility. I provided you the perimeter defense. The minute you applied that application and you made it available to the world, you're responsible for how that application gets attacked. Okay? Those conversations traditionally don't happen with agencies and their customers, or with their customers in general. The combination of these is what we call in the security space the, the, the security chain. Right? And the concept of the security chain is that any element or any chain, any piece, any link within this chain is potential vulnerability. And so we're only as strong as our weakest link. Okay? We have to take that into consideration um, across the entire stack. The thing to understand as well is that within every aspect of the stack, the chain goes deeper. Right? So we can do a chain specifically just for the Drupal application. We can do a chain specifically just for the server environment and the applications within the server. Okay? This is just at a very high level. One of the things that I like to spend a lot of time, and I'll spend a lot more time talking to, is uh, the TTPs, or the tactics, techniques, and procedures that an attacker takes. I find these personally uh, very insightful because it helps us understand what we're dealing with and how attacks are evolving and the things that they're doing. To do this, I'm specifically going to leverage uh, a model that was developed by the Lockheed Martin. Uh, and it's very similar to what you might have seen with Mandy, uh the exploitation lifecycle model. The fundamental difference with Lockheed Martin's model and, and Mandiant's model is that uh, Lockheed Martin it looks at looks to illustrate the entire evolution of the intrusion, uh, and it's designed to help you align every phase of an attack with specific controls that we can implement as defenders or as website administrators, right? So when we look at it, there's uh, seven specific stages in which an attacker operates when they're attacking your website, right? Uh, and what I've done here is I've identified the exact definition that's defined by the kill chain model, and then I've said, okay, what's the application? Or I've tried to draw the correlation to us as website administrators or those working in the website ecosystem. So on the reconnaissance side, right? The studying of public information about the target, the target's environment, software mix practices, software loadout. They're scanning your site, right? Pretty basic. I go to your site, I scan it, I try to see, is he running Drupal, WordPress, Joomla, what's it running? Maybe I scan your IP. What's on this IP? What other applications exist on this? Maybe I scan the ports on your server. What ports exist? What's open? What can I potentially use and exploit to get into that environment? Very, very, in a lot of instances, passive scanning. So they're not designed to trigger any events. But it's the initial phase that we take as an attacker. The weaponization. Once I've identified how I want to get into that environment or what the vulnerabilities look like, which one do I want to exploit? And how do I weaponize that? Am I going to use Metasploit to use some module against some vulnerability that I identified? Drupal Get It has a Metasploit module out there. We can use that to weaponize it and deliver it and attack your website. Which brings it into delivery. Once I've weaponized and I've understood how I'm going to penetrate your environment, I actually deliver it and I actually try to penetrate. I then do the exploitation. I've delivered it, I then exploit the environment, and I try to decide what I'm going to do next. That gets into the installation phase. I go through and I configure whatever I want to do. In a lot of instances, what website owners don't take into consideration, even during a compromise, is that as an attacker, not only do I want to abuse your resources, but I want to ensure that I maintain constant access to that environment. So you'll see things like um, configuration to access control, so that maybe the addition of another user. Right? Uh, maybe the addition of a back door into the web server so that I can bypass any existing controls. And the last piece would be the actions on objectives. What am I going to do to this website? Am I going to distribute malware? Am I going to add it to my botnet? Am I going to do some other nefarious act? So these are the different phases. What the Q chain uh, describes is that this traditionally happens in a linear function, in a, li in a linear flow. 
So it goes from reconnaissance, weaponization, delivery, exploitation, installation, CM2, and actions on objectives. Now, there is some truth to this, perhaps in the enterprise world. But when we work in the world of websites, I believe, as well as do, uh, does my partner, that it's not as linear, and that any phase can be attacked. But what we can do is every phase introduces a potential mitigation point. So by looking at every phase, we can identify ways that we can implement controls to mitigate that specific phase. And the, the one thing to note here is that, for instance, look at Drupal Getting. Drupal Getting would be one of those kind of attacks where I wouldn't necessarily go through the recon reconnaissance or weaponization phase. I would jump right into phase three and four. I already know what the vulnerability is. I already have the ability to attack. And in many instances, what we saw in our environment were attacks against our websites without any care at all what they were running. They were attacking Joomla sites with Drupal Getting payload. They were dragging WordPress sites with the same payload. They were dragging Drupal with the same payload. And they didn't care if you had it or not. They were just looking to see if it was successful. So when it comes to websites, it presents an opportunity to skip around through these different phases. And so what you want to do is, when you're looking at implementing controls with a better understanding of their TTPs, you want to be able to see what controls can I implement? How do I know that someone's scanning? How do I know what vulnerabilities exist? Am I doing any kind of vulnerability scans? Am I being aware of the vulnerabilities that are being disclosed? So we talk a lot about updates. Well, what does updates provide us? It provides us a way to patch known vulnerabilities. Awesome. How about the unknown vulnerabilities? <laughs> right? So, a little something to think about. This actually takes me to uh, another aspect that I talk about, which is kind of the types of attacks that we're experiencing. If we're a large organization, we can expect to see a lot of targeted attacks. I'm Sony. Panama Papers. It's, there's, it's in my interest to attack them and, and, and invest the energy to find information because it's going to be worthwhile. A lot of the websites that you're probably managing and running are not that worthwhile. I, I don't mean to be the bearer of bad news. They're just one of many. Uh, they're low-hanging fruit. And that goes into what I would consider the attacks of, attacks of opportunity. In a lot of instances, we see a lot of automation around attacks of opportunity. Just scanning what exists on the web, what can I exploit, what can I abuse. They really don't care what it is. You can be distributing content on how to make the best cupcakes in the world, right? Um, if they, they don't care, they don't care about the content, it's just another delivery mechanism. And when you tie all these different delivery mechanisms together, they create a very, very large impact on the web. When we're talking specifically about what the attackers do in terms of what they can abuse, I divide them into three distinct domains. Um, I look at external attacks, internal attacks, and what I would categorize to be reflective attacks. Now, reflective isn't necessarily the right term for that. It's a term that we just came up with because we didn't have another term for it. And if you guys have a better one, please let me know. But when I look at external attacks, right, I'm looking at what are they looking to abuse? So they're, they're looking to abuse your access control, right? How do I log in, brute force attacks, things like that. Uh, of course, exploitation of software vulnerabilities, right? What vulnerabilities exist and what can I exploit? Uh, the number one issue, and you see it on the OWASP top 10 as well, is security misconfigurations. Many instances things get deployed, things aren't configured correctly, a lot of dev configurations are pushed into production, there isn't a process for QA, QC, and an attacker can abuse that. Um, and then of course, the, the next big thing we're seeing right now, and growing, and a lot of you have probably heard of it, maybe not, is uh, the continuous attack against the availability of our site through things like distributed denial of service attacks, which are growing exponentially every single day. Okay? Internal attacks. This is perhaps the one area that isn't given a lot of thought, and, and probably second only to reflective attacks. Uh, when I talk about internal attacks, what I'm talking about is uh, the environment in which it sits is a house. And at any point within the house, it can be infected. So if you focus only on one door and you leave all the other doors open, it's a potential problem. And so we see a lot of instances where uh, an, an agency will uh, host an application for their customer, but use that same server for their development environment. Or uh, they'll be responsible for deploying into the customer's environment, but have no visibility into that customer's web server. And so that web server will have another 10, 15 different sites. And so we'll see a compromise, and that compromise will be facilitated through the concept of uh, cross-site contamination. In other words, lateral movement within that environment once the attacker is able to penetrate. Uh, when I talk about reflective attacks, this is another thing that we, we've been seeing uh, grow over the years. Uh, things like uh, attacking the site, but attacking the site indirectly. So uh, think of my ability to compromise your site without actually penetrating your defenses. What would be a simple way of doing that? Think about websites that leverage ads and embed ads within their sites. 
So things like malvertising, my ability to attack the ad network and embed my payload within the header of an image for, um, for an ad would allow me to attack your website without ever actually penetrating your defenses. Okay? Uh, other third-party integrations, we've seen instances where you integrate maybe the wrong module and, and that's hijacked by another user and then all of a sudden they're pushing something. Or um, attacking and hijacking your DNS, something that a lot of website owners don't even think to monitor and look at. Right? Um, so that's another attack vector we're seeing. Actions on objectives. So we've gone through a number of different things, what they do, how they do it, and then finally, what do they want to do with our sites? I've had a couple conversations with individuals here at the event where it's like, well, I have a little brochure site, it doesn't really mean anything, I'm not, they're not going to do anything with it. Well, it actually means a lot, right? Um, and they can actually do a lot depending on the type of organization you are. So of course, if we're an e-commerce site, we're looking at things like, okay, data exfiltration. They want to take my credit card information. But maybe I'm a health site. Maybe they want to take the, the PII information associated with my customers. Right, um, but maybe it's none of that. Maybe I simply just want to distribute malware. Right, the web is still the number one distribution mechanism for the desktop malware that we get on our devices. Right, so when I talk to my mom, please don't click on links. Right, oh my my, my machine isn't working anymore. Ransomware is distributed through malware, and a lot of instances we've seen it get into networks because of that, which is a big big issue for enterprises. How do we filter this kind of traffic? Um, then we've also seen. Well, I don't want to abuse the site itself. Maybe I want to abuse the server resources. Maybe I want to add it to my botnet and use that to attack other sites and use that to obfuscate my location as an attacker. So with this, all this information, my goal is that you hopefully have a better understanding of the threat landscape that we're all working with today. And from this, we can start looking, okay, how do we go about building a framework that is repeatable? Uh, for either our individual sites or as an organization. And you can choose to scale that however you want. To do this, um, I'm going to leverage the Framework for Improving Critical Infrastructure for Cybersecurity, developed by NIST. NIST is a um, non-regulatory agency for the U.S. Department of Commerce. The reason I want to leverage this is because this was released in 2014, and I think it does a really, really good job of providing us a foundation to build on, and it's on us to take that and evolve it to our respective domains. Uh, and it's very simple. It provides very simple common language that we can talk not only to the developers and integrators, but also to our customers and also an opportunity to talk to our superiors as well. Um, before I do that, when we talk about it, it's all built on the concept of risk, which is a critical piece of uh, security. And so when it comes to risk, the basis, the basis of it is it's an ongoing process of identifying, assessing, and responding to risk, right? But it's an ongoing process. You don't just identify one risk and say, I'm set. No, <laughs> you continuously come back and revisit that risk, and you continuously add to that as you address each one. I'll give you a little simple thought exercise. Let's assume I have built a complex time portal using open source technology and Drupal. I have a stringent control process uh, for pushing and updating things in production, including security updates. I have to go through some steps to get this done. Okay? Uh, when I think of the potential risks, uh, it might, uh, might be that a vulnerability is being released. And if that vulnerability is released, how am I going to get that into production in a timely manner? Take into consideration Drupal Getter. They said, what, seven, eight hours if you had an update, consider yourself compromised. A bit dire, um, but that was the reality you're working with. Many organizations would not be able to make a patch in that kind of time frame. So that's a very, very serious risk. And what were the impacts? Well, we just developed the client portal. The impact would be that somebody would be able to get in and steal all my client's information. Would that be an acceptable risk as this organization? And I would, I would encourage you to go through this exercise with every application you build and start introducing security earlier in the conversation. Too often, agencies will introduce security at the completion of the, of the project versus at the commencement of the project. My whole thing is about expectation management. So hey, we're gonna develop this awesome solution for you. It's gonna be a great system. You're gonna be able to do X, Y, and Z. You'll be able to fly to Mars. And then we're gonna talk about security. What? Security. And then like, okay, okay. And you start kind of getting in, into their, their thought process. What I want you to take into consideration when talking about risk, however, it's, it's all about defining your scope, clearly defining your scope. You also have to recognize that risk will never be zero and it is a continuous process. You cannot address every risk. It's like I tell my guys. You can't eat a sandwich without chewing. So you have to take small bites. 
process it, and then move on to the next one. If you try to do everything at the same time, you will accomplish absolutely nothing. I can promise you that. You'll never get to a point where you secured everything. Okay? On the same, I want to also talk about goals, and this is a really important thing. Goals help us define what it is we're trying to achieve. And what you're trying to achieve is, oh, I'm going to deploy a cloud-based firewall. That is not your goal, right? That is an action you're taking to address a goal. So a goal might be, hey, you know, I want to prevent anyone from stealing my customer data. Or uh, I want to prevent people from using my website maliciously. Or I want to prevent my customers from being abused when they come to my website. These goals, well, you can drill into these and help define what you want to do to address each of these. And then you move on. Okay, once I've accomplished these three goals and I feel comfortable with that and I've and I addressed the risks associated with them, move on to the next phase. With this, we can get into the core elements of the framework itself. It's divided into four um, core elements. Functions, which is the high level things that we can easily communicate, right? These are the things you can go upward, you can talk to your customers, etc. Categories and subcategories divide into the specifics we do for the functions and the specifics we do for the categories. And that'll hopefully make sense a little bit here in a second. The references are simply how do you align each of, each of your actions. For instance, um, maybe one of my, you'll, it'll make more sense to him, one of the subcategories I have is you know, become compliant with whatever policy. Here's the link for PCI. Here's the link for FISMA. Here's the link for whatever EU um, uh, regula regulation we, we have to comply with. Within those, the, the, uh, the five key functions that we want to focus on are the identification of problems, the protection of them, detection, response, and recovery. These are the five main elements that we're going to work with when we're building this framework, and that I encourage you to do it. And these are very, very high level, but each of these help guide you what you need to do for each one. Identification. What do I have? The key to security is you have to understand what you're looking to secure. And too often, we don't know what we're looking to secure. We have no idea what assets we have. Protection, what are the things that I'm doing? What hardening am I doing? What configuration changes am I making? What technologies am I deploying? Detection, how am I gonna understand if something does happen? Because we cannot be naive enough to think that whatever we implement will solve all problems. We've already addressed that. We know that security is very complex. So we want to know, okay, I've done everything I possibly can, but if something goes to shit, I'm gonna know that it went to shit. Response, and if it does go to shit, what am I gonna do about it? Do I have a plan in place, and what does that plan look like? And then the recovery, what after actions can we take from this? What are we gonna learn from this process? And then start the whole process again. When you build it, this is kind of what it looks like, at a very high level. A nice little table, and you can put it in a nice little table, and this can be big, and in fact, I was hoping to have a, um, uh, a white paper that I can share with you, in which I provide you a very rudimentary framework that you can take with you and just kind of take it out. I didn't get it done on time, unfortunately. Um, but I will have that done here within the next couple weeks, and I'll, I'll release it as well. But in a very high level, this is what it looks like. Let's dive into each one just to give you a little bit more context. When we go into the identification phase, uh, a category might be within that is asset inventory and management, right? Um, what web properties do I have? I can't tell you the number of times I've worked with an organization, and the first question I say is, I would love to work with you. How many websites have we worked with? Oh, I have no idea. What, I don't, what does that mean? Uh, well, you know, see what happened was, um, I just took over this responsibility, um, I was just given these websites, or we're adding it to a spreadsheet as we get them. Uh, I said, okay, well, roger that. If you don't even have a basic understanding of the web properties you're responsible for, how are you going to begin to secure that? How do you even expect to understand things like updates? How could I even sit here and tell you, you should update, when you don't even know what website you have? Right? Um, that's a big challenge. Web service and infrastructures. Where do you host everything? Oh, I don't know. Uh, you know, the customer has it all in different places. Um, I don't know, that's somebody else in the group. I, I don't really know what that belongs to me. What? Okay, so you don't know what properties you have. You don't know what host you have. How can I begin having the conversation of modules and extensions? If you don't have this stuff listed out somewhere, even in a rudimentary spreadsheet, I'll be happy with that. You can't begin to secure your environment. The, why, the reason it's so critical is once you identify the things that you want, that you need and you have, you can start thinking through, how am I gonna protect these? How am I gonna address the things that I've identified? And maybe one of the responses is, I can't. I have no way to address this issue. 
but at least you know it's there, and it's something you can look at in your response process. On the detection side, how do you know if you were successful? How do you know it's not being abused? Are you being notified? Are you watching it? Are you looking for changes? Is somebody looking? And let me caveat that by saying, you might have a monitoring component in place, but if you have nobody being notified or nobody watching that, then it's like having nothing in place. Let's think about that for a second. And I bring that up, because I've had lots of conversations like, oh yeah, I'm monitoring this, 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 great. Who's, who looks at it? Oh, well, how about that? And I was like, okay, well, let's focus on that piece now. Uh, so this is just a simple way, continuous monitoring, maybe some server level monitoring, monitoring your access points. There should be nobody that knows your application better than yourself. So in other words, what I mean by that, if I'm sleeping at 2 a.m. in California, but somebody in China is logging into my application, that should be an alert of some kind. We should be able to build those rules in and say, hey, that should not be allowed because I have nobody working in Shanghai. Okay? Um, integrity monitoring, a very, very simple thing to look at. Did the integrity of the baseline change? Did somebody modify one of my PHP files? Did somebody modify one of my articles? Those are strong, strong indicators that is a potential compromise, requiring some form of action that would initiate our response protocol. But if we don't know what we do in those instances, then we have no response protocol, right? How many people have thought about, what am I gonna do if there's a compromise? In a lot of instances, the conversations I have is, oh, I, I don't need to worry about that. The host will take care of it. Then they get compromised and talk to the host, like, whoa, we don't, we don't take care of that. That's on you. Right? So nobody's had that conversation, and we need to have that conversation. How many agencies have talked to their customers, hey, in the event of a security issue, this is what we're prepared to provide for you. I can tell you one thing, your customers are expecting you to provide that service if you have a sustainment contract, whether you've agreed to it or not. And that'll bring up another issue. So developing some form of incident response protocol or some process for what you're going to do. Okay, in the event of an incident, and an incident can be I get blacklisted by Google or I get blacklisted by one of these threat intelligence feeds out there that some obscure system is integrating. How are you gonna to respond to that? How are you gonna provide a service to your organization or uh, to your customers? And the last piece is the recovery. So once you've done this and you've fixed whatever needed to be fixed, what, do you, what changes are you going to make? What discussions are going to be had internally to ensure that this doesn't get addressed, that this gets addressed in the future? When it's all said and done, this is what it looks like. A very, very basic just, uh, breakdown of each of the groups. Now, I provided only one example, but within the identification phase, you can have multiple categories. And so you start having you know, a one-to-many relationship between identification and categories and a many-many relationship between categories and subcategories. And the subcategories are, def are designed to be specific actions you take to address the high-level categories. And each of these flow up into the fun functions. And so you can break this down and have conversations with whoever the audience is. Hey, this is how I address security. I do these different five phases. This is how I address each one. When you talk to your integrators and developers, these are the things we're going to do moving forward, knowing that they all roll up into an overarching framework. The biggest issue I see is that a lot of organizations will place all their emphasis on two functions, protection and detection, yet they don't know what they're protecting. They have the, 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 the most recent site that went up and live, but they don't have a list, they don't have identification of what's happening. They don't have a process for response or recovery. And so I challenge everybody, think beyond the limitations of protection and detection, and look at a more comprehensive approach to addressing your security. And we have to remember that security is an all-encompassing process. It's a continuous system, right? You don't just start identification and stop. You should have a system in place, hey, on a quarterly basis, let's go through and identify our list. Do we still have these domains in our environment? Do, are we still leveraging the, these applications? Do they still do these things? Are the controls in place efficient or effective for the things that we're doing now as an organization? Because just because you created a list two years ago doesn't mean that it's still applicable. Okay? If you're wondering why this all even matters, um, these are a couple, of, a couple of reasons, right? From a business standpoint, there's the impacts to your brand. If you're an agency and you're delivering services and you get compromised, regardless of what the reason was, you'll still get blamed for it. 
oh, it's their development. They suck. They're not going to understand, oh, no, you, well, you see what happened was there was this one module um, and there was this vulnerability and your, your, your change configuration process didn't allow us to update it in time. And you know what it really was was a SQL injection. What happened is it got into the database and then when they did the database went to the server, their eyes are already rolling in the back of their heads. They're like, I don't know what the hell this guy's talking about. Right? He's just trying to get more money out of me. <coughs> There's the economic impacts if you're the organization itself. Assume you're working on an e-commerce site, or assume you're working on an organization that requires their online presence to generate some form of revenue. When we have seen websites get blacklisted, they'll lose their revenue 90, 95% in the, in the first 48 to 72 hours. Now, imagine the impacts of that going into a week, two weeks, three weeks, right? It'd be really, really impactful. Um, and you cannot, we cannot undervalue the impacts of emotional distress. I can't tell you the number of customers I've talked to where uh, their livelihoods depend on their web properties, and now they don't understand themselves what happened or how it happened, and they're emotionally distraught about this. There, it, it, there's this like virtual vulnerability. Who would have done this to me? Why would they have done this to me? Um, and then, of course, there's the new liability, right? More and more, we're seeing more um, new legislation talking to what the actions are by the various governments and local municipalities on what they can do to businesses um, if they allow themselves to be used maliciously and attack their, their uh, website owners. That's just on the business side, right? Um, there's, there's a technical, technical element to it, right? Um, there's the actual work of fixing the compromise, or there's the actual work of identifying what the attacker did, and, and the distress that you get from, is this all they did? There's always that, are they still watching me? Unless you're like us, and we just assume we're always hacked, right? Um, a lot of people don't operate that way. But there's, such a, there's a certain level of vulnerability that you go through where it'll take you a long time to recover from that. Well, did I get all the back doors? Are they still in my site? Do I know that they're really not watching me? Am I gonna get hacked again in three months? Am I gonna have to go through this whole process again? And then trying to figure that out on the level of effort. Of course, the impacts of website blacklisting, SEO impacts, things like that. Um, but it's just things to, think, things to consider. And then lastly, uh, I can't have a talk without presenting you a number of tools uh, available in the Drupal repository <laughs> that you can configure and deploy and do uh, a number of things that I was talking to. So here are some of the, the top modules that I've seen uh, a lot of people talking about, a lot of people deploying, leveraging. Each of them are designed to function different aspects of stuff that we talked about, and I would encourage you to check them out. Again, though, before you even get to this phase, I would encourage you to go back and Think about your goals from a security standpoint. Think about your risk, and then get into the types of tools you want to deploy. Um, the other thing I would encourage folks to look at are things like cloud-based solutions. Right? Uh, security is becoming more and more complex. It's evolving every single day, uh, and it's hard enough for organizations to keep up with their own development tasks, let alone the security uh, responsibilities um, that they're being asked to account for. So there's a lot of cloud-based solutions uh, out there available to help you, uh, and I would encourage you to leverage them. So with that, uh, I would open up to any questions and answers, or questions, and I'll try to provide answers. Please, please, guys, one at a time. <laughs> yeah, I've got no answers. So uh, you mentioned listing and knowing the components sure. of the website. I have a specific question about, uh, about uh, security. What's your, you speak uh, what's your, uh, oh, about security? So the question is, uh, I spoke about listing uh, modules and things like that, and uh, inventory, management. inventory management. He was asking specifically what we do as, as an organization. Uh, I'm not really sure if we're allowed to get into that. I know they're very anti-pitching like pitching and stuff like that. Um, so do you, does any, do you folks want to hear what we do and how we do it? No. Okay, so um, so we are a cloud-based solution, right? Uh, and we, we actually offer three distinct things. I just I oversimplify when I talk about internet protecting. One of those is uh, we provide some form of inventory management where an organization is able to take all their web assets and load it into our environment, and we will provide continuous scanning. We don't do vulnerability scanning. What we do is uh, scanning and looking for indicators of what we consider indicators of compromise. Indicators of compromise is very similar to what we were discussing. Sometimes an attacker will penetrate your environment and um, 
they won't necessarily do anything malicious, but they'll make a slight little change. And that change would be an indicator of a compromise. Or maybe somebody flagged it as a potential issue. Uh, we would identify that as an indicator of compromise. So we're looking, and then we're looking at changes, things like DNS, SSL. Uh, any of those kind of externally facing indicators are things we're gonna flag for. We look at, of course, malware distribution. Uh, we look at payloads on the server. That's where our inventory comes into place. We won't drill into uh, things like the modules you're leveraging, uh, things like that, um, but it's more at a high level. What are all the domains you have? Because that's usually the first question we need to ask, and by monitoring that, we can get a good understanding of, of what's happening so with the environment. Your, your listing in your case would not be uh, listing the components that have knowledge. Correct, correct. That, that's another level, that's another layer down, and we won't get into that. Uh, the second piece of that is, of course, the incident response. So if someone's been compromised, we have, as a service, we go in and we'll clean that up for you. Uh, we'll identify the payloads, et cetera. And then the third piece is the actual protection. We have a cloud-based uh, WAF and IDS where we're looking to mitigate all external attacks at the edge. So all via DNS, we take your information, we route it through our network, um, and we strip out all malicious requests. So things like exploitation against vulnerabilities, SQL injections, things like that, um, would all get stopped at the edge, denial of service attacks, uh, that sort of stuff. So very high level. But any other questions pertaining to this? And Yeah. Question uh, regarding sure. the payloads that you see, it's a little bit more of a private interest because in the organization where I work, everyone is getting crazy about local admin rights, etc. So this is being stripped and uh, having less and less rights on a local machine, it's uh, so far secure, or at least in the uh, ISAP management. My question was rather do you see erasing the ransomware, which I particularly find deadly because you don't really need any special rights, but it starts encrypting your disk and documents, and then the CEO actually has information which is going to be, uh, as a security company, do you see more of this coming these days? Is it something that we have to really be careful about? Or? So, so the question is, do I see a rise in ransomware, right? Um, uh, desktops or websites? Well, desktops, but probably de de uh, delivered through websites. Yeah, so um, there's two aspects to this. There's actually, we started to see a trend where attackers are trying to leverage ransomware on websites, um, which is not as effective as its counterpart on desktops, uh, because you just uh, apply a backup if you have one, right? Um, if it's part of your framework and you have a plan for backups, uh, which sometimes doesn't happen. But there is a rise in the distribution of desktop ransomware via the web. So, and that's been over the past 12 months, we've seen that continuously increase, right? There's a lot of organizations like um, Malwarebytes is continuously writing a lot of research on uh, the, deliver the, the exploit kits being uh, expanded upon by distributing ransomware to the endpoints. And we are seeing that through the web. Um, we are seeing a, an interesting increase on ransomware specifically affecting websites, but they're just not as effective. Uh, does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, so their concerns are not that far-fetched. Any other questions? We are actually seeing an increase as well in uh, denial of service attacks, right? Which is what's really interesting about denial of service attacks is that um, unlike, un unlike other attacks where the attacker is trying to abuse your resources or abuse your audience, right? Uh, they're actually attacking the website owners themselves. And they're saying, you know what? I could attack your audience, but I could probably make a lot of money on you. And so we've seen this rise of, hey, if you don't pay me this many Bitcoins, uh, I'm going to denial of service you, and I'm going to take you offline. Um, or we've seen a lot of retaliation. A classic example of this was last week with Brian Krebs. I don't know who's familiar with Brian Krebs, you know, where he suffered. He was taken completely offline with a 650 gigabit per second denial of service, one of the biggest ones until OVH just came out with a release at 1.1 tetabytes, right? So it, it's just, it's just getting... It's just getting bigger and bigger, um, and the problem is getting interesting. And I, I wrote an article on um, the impacts to website availability, and I think it's something that a lot of organizations just aren't prepared for, right? Um, and there are different forms of, of denial of service, right? A lot of organizations are traditionally uh, familiar with layer three and layer four, which is really a matter of pipe, right? Who has the biggest pipe? Whoever has the biggest pipe wins, right? But when we start talking about layer seven, hey, I see you laughing at <laughs> Not how I intended it. Uh, when we start talking about layer seven specifically, uh, the game changes, right? Because layer seven, we're talking about requests per second versus bits per second or packets per second, right? We're talking about number of requests. So 
100 requests in a second, you know, a lot of instances can take down a server. And what they're doing there is instead of trying to abuse your infrastructure resources or, or trying to attack the, your infrastructure link, they're attacking your application resources. So 100 requests, it's 100 requests your server has to spin up. And a lot of organizations just aren't prepared for that. And so that starts attacking the resources. So, and the interesting thing is to do a layer seven attack is a lot simpler than to do a layer three or layer four attack, right? I don't need as many systems and a lot of resources. I can get 100 servers or 100 boxes, 100 websites, use them as a part of my botnet, and each one sends out a request or sends out 10 requests. Immediately I'm overloading web servers. Anyways, I don't know why I said that, but nobody was asking a question, so I'm just imparting knowledge. <laughs> Any other questions? Was it useful, guys? Yeah. yeah. Awesome. I actually have a question. I, I already stopped taking questions. Damn it. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I'll see you next year. Then. Yeah. <laughs> I'll say, um, so you're talking about uh, getting getting kind of like a whole organization on board with a particular yeah. you know framework and all this the planning and whatnot. Um, do you have any good examples of uh, without naming names, obviously, <coughs> but groups that were perhaps resistant to adopting some of those strategies, where you know parts are parts come into place easily, but other parts less so, or I, I especially larger organizations. I don't because um, that's actually not a service we offer. Okay. Um, I'm simply up here just sharing this, right? Uh, things that I've seen, things that are effective. I do a lot of research. I look at how other organizations have done. So I can't talk to any experiences that we haven't offered that as a professional service at all. We are a product, we're a product company. That's what we do. But when I give up and give talks, I try to give higher talks that I've seen um, that come from our experiences working with organizations. When, when we're doing, uh, the incident response process, and we're going through, hey, I want to see this documentation, or hey, help me understand what I'm working with, they're missing all these pieces. And so I've gone out and I've started to do research on like, what can be effective? And how can I take that and simplify it in a way that hopefully people can adopt? Uh, and so that's why I'm presenting it, hopefully that one of you can apply it, and then next year you tell me how amazing it was, and how you applied it and it worked, and I can use it as a use case. <laughs> so if you have questions, ping me, I'd love to work through it with you. Uh, but I don't have any examples, unfortunately. Yes. May I have a last one? Absolutely. Uh, I don't want to. Oh, really... and for anybody, what anybody listening, the the last question there was. Um, I'm supposed to repeat them. Um, the last question there was, have I seen anybody that's effectively applied a model like this? And my response was, no, because I'm actually this first time I'm introducing the model to you guys. I built it just for this. Uh, I was just wondering if you have any uh, any sort of influence in your internet service provider. I think I was stuck in the code, but. Uh, when you see heavy load of traffic coming in your uh, defenses, can you, instead of trying to manipulate for some ticketing system, do, they, do you have uh, understanding with them to reconfigure their routers? Some yeah, of your competitors so were bragging that they actually obtained this from the internet. Yeah, so the question was, um, do we, we have any influence with uh, any of the internet providers or the tier one providers, essentially, to uh, uh, more aggressively mitigate or respond to uh, large attacks? Is that right? Perfect. Um, that's a really weird thing to claim, right? No tier one is going to allow you to say, hey, you know what? You're a great guy. You're a great company. I'm going to let you log into my environment and manipulate my routers. Um, I've never seen that. Uh, so whatever competitor you're looking at that says that, amazing. You should probably go with them. Um, usually what the way it works, however, is there are a number of exchanges that make up the backbone of the net internet, right? And so as organizations, we have an opportunity to uh, embed with those exchanges. You, you, you come to an agreement and through those exchanges, it kind of reduces kind of how hops work, things like that. It's a little bit more complicated than that. I'm oversimplifying it. Um, no, I cannot log into a tier one provider's environment and manipulate their switches or their routers in the event of a large scale attack. I've never seen anybody do that. What I have seen is, um, as an organization, we have the ability to work with them uh, to mitigate an attack, right? So we're seeing a large attack. What can we do together? Can we mill route attacks? You know, can we make these configuration changes, etc.? Um, so yeah, I don't know. I think that answers your question. We don't. Whoever can do that is amazing. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, guys. Well, thank you very much for having me. Thank you.